Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. In verse 49, Jesus stopped. Everyone say that again. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. And the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and he followed Jesus along the road. You can be seated. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're looking good today. If your spouse is with you, turn to them and say, you're looking downright hot. Come on. Even if you have to say it in faith. Come on, somebody say amen. Um, I love this passage of scripture. And it, because of what it is, because of what happens in this passage of scripture, I love it. And God does so many really great things. But in this picture, we see something that is significant. 
And, and, and here's what I, I want to tell you and what the whole series is about. It's about this, simply this, that just one moment in the presence of God can change your life. We're hearing testimonies and testimonies of people who are experiencing the presence of God and it's changing their life. Things are happening in their life that things were one way and then God moved in their life and then now they're another way. And I think it's very important for us to understand that's how the power of the presence of God works. So we want the power of the presence of God. And I know a lot of times we associate the power of the presence of God with craziness and wildness and all of this stuff. And that's not what we're attempting to do at all. We're not attempting to be wild or crazy, but what we do want is we want the power and the presence of God. And God is different than we are. So sometimes God, when he shows up and does things, it's, it's very different than what we're used to and what's normal to us. And so it makes us feel a little uncomfortable. Well, it's because he's God and you're not, and he's different. Jesus did crazy things it, to, to the people of that day. It was like, what, what is he doing? He's doing crazy things. Like, you know, he took mud one time and put it on someone's eyes and healed them like that. And you know what? I think he did that. There's no, there was no healing properties in that dirt. I think he did that just to show everybody, look, it's not always like you think it is. It doesn't always look like you think it is. And I, I see that we're having this revival in, at Asbury and everybody's saying, well, is it revival? Is it not revival? Is it the power of God? Is it not the power of God? And the truth is it never looks the same. When God moves, it looks like he wants it to look. We can't put God in a box. And sometimes we we try to, but we cannot. Jesus was just different. He did things differently. He's the son of God. He doesn't do things like we do. He doesn't operate or function like we operate or function. He's just different. And so we need to just accept that and say, God, whatever you want for me, if it's in your word, I receive it and I believe it. If it's what your word says, I receive it and I believe it. Now I'm not going to believe or receive anything that's not backed up by his word, but if God's spirit is moving and it's backed up by his word, I'm receiving it. It and I'm believing it because I'm not going to allow the world to, or religious people to turn me into a cynic about the power and presence of God. You have to understand, I'm not just a person who has uh, read in the Bible about people being healed. I've seen people personally healed with my own eyes. As I have prayed for them, I've seen them healed. I have been healed myself in my own life where God listened. I, not, I didn't go to the doctor. I did nothing wrong with it. We believe that that's a part of the way God heals with doctors and medicine. But also sometimes God divinely interacts with us and can heal us. He healed me one time immediately. I had an, a severe back problem that threatened my the rest of my life that it was going to be that way. And a, a, a pastor prayed for me. And in a moment, this was a problem where I couldn't even sit in a car for 15 minutes because my legs hurt so bad. I was a grown man. It would make me tear up. That's how much pain I was in. And 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 I went to this this pastor and, and we had prayed several times and nothing happened. And he just said, man, I just really believe God wants to heal you. And he prayed for me again. And when he prayed for me, immediately God healed me. Now you can argue healing with me all day long, but you, you're going to lose that battle, at least as far as I'm concerned, because God has touched my life. It's the same way with salvation. God saved me. He changed me. Listen, I was a wretched sinner. Wretched. I was wretched and wretched, as they used to say. I, I was a bad sinner, but God touched my life. That's a greater miracle than healing my body. He touched my life from the inside and changed me. That's what God can do. He's different than we are, and he's better than we are, and he's greater than we are. So we have to accept that there are things that are different than what we expect or different than what we have seen. And here you have Jesus walking through the streets. People are following him. He's been teaching. He's been doing all kinds of different things. And people are following him. And it's a, an amazing thing uh, what he's doing. And everybody's excited. And, and all these religious leaders are following him. And all these disciples are following him. He's going through the streets. And they go by this man whose name is Blind Bartimaeus. That's what they call him. His name was Bartimaeus because he was Timaeus' son. Bar means son of. And Timaeus is the name of the father. So that's why they called him Bartimaeus. 
but he was also blind. So they identified him. He's not just Bartimaeus. He's blind Bartimaeus. He was living a life identified by his incapabilities, not his capabilities. He was identified by his weaknesses, not his strengths. He was identified by his problems, not his purpose. And God wants to change that in all of us. And so here he is sitting and he's heard because there's something about when you can't see, you can hear a lot better. And he heard about Jesus and he heard the stories and he heard the reputation of Jesus. And so when he heard that Jesus was coming by, he decided, I'm going to get his attention. And so it's exactly what he did. He started yelling out, Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And it made the crowd uncomfortable. And they started saying, no, 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 be quiet. You're just causing a ruckus. He's got things to do. He's busy. He's got to go. He's got to move. He's got to teach. He's got to do these things. And you're getting in the way because you're yelling and you're slowing everything down. Just be quiet, blind Bartimaeus and sit over there in your blindness and just, just, just don't bother anybody. And so blind Bartimaeus did exactly the opposite. Jesus, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David. Somehow he understood the Messiahship of Jesus. And he said, I know you're him. I know you're the king. I know you're the one. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. He just kept yelling and kept yelling. And people just kept trying to say, be quiet. Listen, it's funny to me when you really get desperate for God, how other people, it makes them uncomfortable and they will try to get you to shut down. Listen, you should... You can't believe like that. You can't be radical like that. You can't give like that. You can't serve like that because that's just, you're just being radical. You're just being great. Listen, when you get desperate for Jesus, you'll act different. You'll do different. You'll be different. And it doesn't matter if it makes other people uncomfortable. Well, I guess to, to three of us, it doesn't matter that it makes other people uncomfortable. It really doesn't because we're not trying to win popularity contests. We're trying to gain the purpose of God in our lives for the benefit of the kingdom of God in heaven. So finally, something powerful happens. Jesus, on his way to wherever it is was going, stops. And he stops and he says, bring that blind man to me. And that blind man comes to Jesus and he does something so significant. He gets up. You just read it in the scripture and you don't understand its significance. He gets up and he throws his cloak off. Well, what you have to understand is that cloak was his identity. Because a blind man in that culture could only do one thing, beg. He didn't have a way to make a living. He didn't have a way to get an income. So he was sitting there in that cloak, identified by his problem, not his purpose. Identified by his weaknesses, not his strengths. Identified by his issues, not his, his, his uh, purpose in God. And here he is covered in that cloak that identifies him as a beggar. And when he gets up and goes to Jesus, he throws it off. Now, why would the Bible go to the problem of actually adding that in? Why would it tell us what he did in that moment? Because here's what was happening. And this is why Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. Because he was saying, if I get to Jesus, then all I have to do is get to him. And I can throw, I don't need this beggar's cloak anymore. Because once I get to him, my blindness is going to be healed. And I can work like everybody else works. And that's the truth of it. The truth of it is that when you get to Jesus and you really encounter him, it changes your life. But what I want to draw our attention to in just the next couple of minutes, I want to draw our attention to this. He stopped. He stopped. He had lots of people that were counting on him. He had lots of places to go. Yet when this man cried out for help, he stopped. It was a divine interruption. It was a divine interruption. I'll never forget. And what I want to do is I want to draw our attention to the fact that many of the miraculous things Jesus did, he did because he was interrupted. You hear me? Everybody say the word interrupted. He did because he was interrupted. Think about all the things he did. He did because he's interrupted. A few years ago, uh, many years ago actually, I was uh, in Oklahoma City working. And one morning I was 
I, I mean, one night I'd gone to bed, and then about 3 o'clock in the morning, God woke me up. I mean, when I say God woke me up, you say, well, wow, God woke you up really. What, what I mean is this. I just woke up with this understanding I had a compulsion. I knew I needed to get to the church. Now, that, that sounds weird because, and here's, what I, here's how I interpreted it at the time. I thought, I thought God was telling me, I thought God was telling me, um, you've got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of things depending on you. You need to get to the church, get started early before anyone's there and get your work done. I was the senior associate of the church at the time. And so there was a lot that was riding on me and I was really wanting to do well. And God was really, and I thought God's saying, go up there, get started early. You're going to get interrupted later. And so I go up there, man, I get ready. I try to stay as quiet as I can. Don't want to wake my wife up. And it's about four o'clock when I leave the house and about 4.30 or 4.20 or 4.30, I get to the church. And when I get there, there's another guy there, another one of the staff members. And he said, man, did, he said, I just felt like I had to come to the church. And I said, yeah, yeah, me too. So I said, you go in your office and work. I'll go in my office and work. And maybe we can just use this time. Maybe God's just trying to give us a head start on some things. And so we go in and all of a sudden, now listen, if you've ever been in a church at night with the, the, well, if you've ever been in a church at all with the lights turned off in the middle of the day, it is one creepy place. Let me tell you, it's scary. It creaks, it moves, especially here. The wind sounds like a ship going down when you're in here, when the wind's blowing in West Texas. And I'm telling you then there in Oklahoma city, I was in that office and I'm telling you, it was eerie and dark. And you know, we, I was, I was in a basement office working on some video. And so I was down there and man, I just, it was, and all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. I heard that sound. I'm like, that ain't right. That something ain't right. And I mean, we were off the highway, so we a lot of times got people, you know, that were in bad spots that would come off the highway and need help. And, but this was like 5 in the morning, like 5 a.m. And, 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 and boom, 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 I hear this sound. Boom, boom, boom. And, and, and it just keeps going. Boom, boom, boom. And I'm like, what is happening? So I start up the stairs. I go up. I'm in the lobby. And the guy's coming out of his office. And we're both in the lobby. And then we're standing there looking at each other. And we're looking at the door. And there's a guy in the on the glass door. He's leaned up against the door. And he's hitting the door as hard as he can. And I looked at him and looked at me as if to say, well, there's two of us here. If something pops off, we'll get him. And so we walk over to the door. And I open it up. And he basically falls into my arms, and he's bawling, and he's crying. Now listen very carefully to what happens. He's bawling. This is a true story. I can go find the guy that was there, and he'll tell you this is true. He falls into my arms, and he immediately starts bawling. And I get him to calm down. I say, what's wrong? What's happening? What's going on? Are you okay? He's like, no, I'm not okay, man. I have ruined my life. And I said, well, what, what have you done? And he said, man, I'm a gambler, and, and, and my wife has threatened me. She said, if I do this again, she's done with me. And, and, and he said, I went and took my whole paycheck and her paycheck, and I gambled it all and lost it all. I don't know how we're going to pay the bills. He said, I, he said, I'm a drunkard. I'm an alcoholic. I don't know. He said, she's never going to take me. She kicked me out. He said, I have nowhere to go. I've been driving around the city. And, and then he said this. He said, I was actually driving my car to that bridge. And there's a bridge about a quarter of a mile down from our church. And he said, my goal was to drive my car off that bridge and kill myself. And he said, when I got to the corner, he said, I swear to you, you're going to think I'm crazy. But when I got to the corner, I heard a voice in my car say, go to that church right now. And I said, I'm not going to that church. And he said, I was talking back to this voice. And he said, I heard it. Go to church right now. And he said, there's not going to be anybody at that church to help me. It's 5 in the morning. There's not. And he said, that voice told him, there is someone there to help you. And when he came in and he saw us there, it was just a wild thing for him. He was like, so here's what I'm saying to you. God literally woke us up. And put us in a place, and we didn't even know why we were there, so that when he drove by, he wouldn't kill himself, but he would come to Jesus. And he gave his life to the Lord, and he got back with his wife, and God worked it out. God gives us divine interruptions. God gives us moments, just like Jesus. I want you to think about Jesus and how many times he did the miraculous and how the miraculous happened and when it happened. 
Th- just, let's just take one little short passage of Scripture, Mark 4, Mark 5, Mark 5, uh, 22, Mark 5, 27. Let's just look at what happened with Jesus. Jesus, you have to understand, was not a, he was a planner. He was a person on a mission. He had three years. He had three years to pour so much into 12 guys and maybe at most 120 that actually he spent a lot of time with. And he pouring into them and teaching them and training them so that they would spread the gospel when, when he died and went to heaven. Th- th- think about that. When he died and resurrected, he had spent three years just spending most of his time with those 12. That's what he had to do. He had to teach. He had to preach. He had to do miracles. He had to do all of these things. And he was on a mission. He, listen, three years isn't very long. And he wasn't a guy that just meandered around waiting to see what would happen. He was always on the move, always had a plan, always was going somewhere to do something for someone. It's just the way he lived. But if you'll pay attention, when you look at all of his attempts to go here or go there, do this and do that, miraculous things happened when he was on his way because of divine interruption. Look at, look at Mark chapter 4, verse 35. They were, he was tired. He'd been teaching all day. He said, let's get in a boat. Let's go to the other side. They get in the middle of the, the lake. A big storm rises up. He's asleep in the bottom of the boat. They wake him up and say, don't you care? We're dying. He gets out and stands on the edge of the boat. Peace be still to all the winds and the waves. He did a miraculous thing as a divine inter- interaction. It's when the disciples first said, who are you? And how do you have the power to do that? A divine interruption brought that revelation. Look, he, got, he gets out of the boat. They get to the other side of the boat. He gets out of the boat. And as soon as he gets out of the boat, he's still tired because he didn't even get to finish his nap. He was trying to sleep, and he's still tired. And, and instead, instead of giving up and saying, hey, let's just go find a place where I can sleep, where I can rest, I'm tired. Instead, he gets out of the boat, and there's a demoniac there, a guy filled with demons. And he heals him and delivers him of his de- de- demonic uh, possession and, and get, sets him free from all of that in his life, sets him free and then they began to start going towards another place and because it was the plan here's where we're going and as he's going a man that's a ruler in the synagogue comes up to him and he says his name is Jairus and he said listen I've heard about you I know you can do great things I know you can do good things I've heard about you I know what you can do and my daughter is laying at home and she's dying and if you'll just come to my house I want you to watch this he just stops and listens to Jairus and Jairus says if you would just come to my house and you know what his response was sometimes we call out on God and we wonder will you help us will you be there for us his immediate response was yes let's go he stopped changed his direction because of a divine interruption you know there are some interruptions that are just interruptions but then there are others that are divine And as he's on his way to Jairus' daughter to heal her, a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years and could not get free, been to every doctor and every... As he's on his way to heal Jairus' daughter, this woman comes behind him and grabs the hem of his garment and heal, it heals her because of her faith. And he turns around and stops. She didn't even want him to stop. She said, all I have to do is touch his garment. I don't, he doesn't have to stop. I don't, even have, I don't even want him to know I'm there. But instead, he turns around and purposefully confronts her. He says, virtue left me. Did you know there's a place of faith in God that you can touch God in such a way that even involuntarily he can change your life? Isn't it powerful? So powerful. So she's healed. And all of these healings, and this is only a small sample if you go throughout the Gospels of how many times Jesus did miraculous things on the way. He opened his life up to divine interruption. And that's what I'm asking of us today. I'm closing with this. You're going to say this because it's a good rationalization we all use for a lot of different things. You're going to say this, yeah, but it's Jesus. Yeah, but it's Jesus. Of course Jesus is going to do that. Of course Jesus is. 
capable of that. Of course Jesus is going to stop what he's doing. Of course Jesus is going to be compassionate. Of course Jesus is going to love. You're acting as if Jesus wasn't busy. When we think like that, we're acting as if somehow we're more important than Jesus. see where I'm going divine interruptions God has for all of us that's why he called us your, remember we said it a while ago your kingdom come your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven in other words I know you have a perfect plan in heaven will you manifest it in my life and Jesus says sure I will but you're going to have to get ready for some divine interruptions powerful thing about that is God will truly use your life if you're not scared to have some divine interruptions. If you're not too busy to have some divine interruptions. So the question is, are we willing? And this series is all about the power of His presence and what one moment in His presence can do in our lives. And the question is, do we make any room for His presence? In other words, is it okay for God to interrupt us? Even if it's not okay for people to interrupt our busy schedule, is it okay for God to interrupt us? A couple of weeks ago, I, I, we were having a service, and man, there was just a moment, and it, it just was a really good moment, and we could sense the presence of God. And in my heart, I felt like, you need to go preach right now. You need to go preach right now. It's not the order of service. It's not the way we do things, but you need to go preach right now. And then... Pastor Scotty, he also had that same feeling that I needed to go preach right now. And then Connor also had that same feeling. And Taylor and Janae had the same feeling. But all of us thought, well, we have a flow. We have an order. We better just, we better just, just go with that. And instead of doing that, we just went with the flow. I'm confessing a little bit to you. So whoever was needing a breakthrough that day, I'm sorry. I blocked it. You know why? Because I was so married to we've got to do things this way. We've got to we've got to follow our plan. We've got to And I'm not saying don't be a planned person or a purpose person. God Jesus was not this person who's just whatever spontaneous. Let's just run around and see what happens. That's not how Jesus was at all. But what I am saying is is God allowed to interrupt you? Is God allowed to show up in your house with your kids and interrupt you? Some of you are asking, God, help me with my kids so bad, but you won't let him in the front door. Are you with me? We cannot allow the plans and the purposes that we create to, to put us in a position where God can never interrupt. I can't tell you the times that this has happened to me. And, and so here's some questions. Some questions are this. Is it possible if we said to God, interrupt our lives, that he would release the power of his presence into our lives and use us to do something that would change someone else's life. The second is, could it be that we pray for God to move and he wants to interrupt our lives with the power of his presence, yet we don't make any room for him to do it? God, please move in my life, but you won't, you won't change anything. You won't stop anything. You won't quit anything. You won't make room for him to be able to change your life. You just keep going and keep pushing and keep shoving and keep going and keep doing and and and, and, and then you're saying, God, please please help. And, 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 and he won't because you won't allow him to interrupt. You won't allow him to say, stop for a minute. Not just in your physical life but in your mental life. In your emotional life. God is saying, I would love to get involved, but you won't let me interrupt you. How many of you have ever talked to someone that you can't get a word in edgewise? How many of you have ever talked to someone like that? Man, y'all, is your arms broken? How many of you have ever talked to someone you could, you could, there was no, you, there was no way you could say anything to them? And the way they talk, that they could have a conversation. You could be sitting there, but they're really talking to themselves. How, how many of you ever realized that? Yeah. I think sometimes that's what God is doing with us. He's like, oh, oh. okay, so we, we, yeah, I, I, yeah, let me. Do. Well, Jesus, I gave you a couple of minutes. I got to go now. Are you with me? 
how to have the power of God's presence active in your life. Three things. One, do what Jesus did. Live life on purpose, have a plan, but make room for interruption. Okay? In other words, don't take your life all the way to the margins. Don't push your life, make it so busy that you're all the way to the margins and you can't change anything or your whole schedule's gonna fall apart. Maybe your schedule needs to fall apart. Live life on purpose, have a plan, but make room. Uh, uh, I remember uh, hearing a story about a young man who was just trying to do something nice for his, he, he was going to church at a specific church and he's trying to do something, something nice and he was, God, God, what can I do? And he was in line at a, uh, a, a hamburger joint and he was in the drive through window and he just felt like God prompted him by the meal of the person. He said, I've never done that before. I've heard of people doing that. And it wasn't one of those days where everybody bought everybody's meal. It was just, I just heard God say in my heart, by the meal of the person behind you. So he did. And then he just drove off. Didn't say anything. Didn't leave a car. Didn't do nothing. Just bought the meal, drove off. But on the back of his car, like we have here, stickers, there was a sticker of his church. So later, that church got a phone call from that person whose meal had gotten bought. And they saw what church it was, so they called the, the, the front desk of the church, big church, and they said, uh, hey, listen, I don't know who this person is, but I got their license plate, and I want somebody to communicate this to them. He said, I was in that line. My life is devastated. Everything has gone wrong for me. I have no reason to live. And I literally was thinking to myself, and I had the plan, I'm going to get this burger, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to kill myself because there's no reason to live. And he said, but when he bought that for me, I can't tell you the hope of humanity that came up in my soul. And I just want him to know he saved my life. You see, that's a divine interruption. It's not just doing good things for doing good things. It's no, when God gives you that moment, are you able to stop and say, all right, God, what do you want me to do? Are you able to put it on pause? Or are you so moving so fast and doing so much that if God interrupted you himself and said, I need you to go over and do this, you couldn't even do it. It's something we have to ask ourselves. The second thing is think like Jesus thought. In other words, love God, love people, have compassion, and be willing to stop for them. Third, he said, let your life be fueled by prayer. Because this is what Jesus did. He prayed all the time. Let your life be fueled by prayer. And what this does, when you get in prayer and you pray consistently, it makes you sensitive to his presence. It makes you act on his purpose. And it causes you not to shrug off his presence when he calls. So if you think this isn't true, I want to conclude with this. If you think this isn't a pattern, if you think I'm just saying this to get you to do more as a believer or to get more people in church or do whatever, I am. I do want you to do that. But that's not, that's not, I'm telling you this today because it's true. If you don't believe me, just read this. Luke chapter 23, verse 36. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked that criminal and said, Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him truly. I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. See, here's the point. Even while he was dying, he was dying. And he wasn't just dying a death of crucifixion. He was dying a death that God had put all the sins of the world on him. The Bible says he wasn't even recognizable as a human. He looked like a beat up animal. But even in that pain where he couldn't breathe and he's pushing on nail pierced feet to take a breath and he's hanging down on nail pierced wrist trying to figure out how to just keep breathing. A 
man calls him and says, hey, will you help me? And in his death, he says, I'll help you. God is doing something here. He's doing something in our lives. He's moving in a specific, in a certain way. And part of it is because he's saying to us, will you allow me to interrupt you divinely? And will you be used by my hand to do something significant for someone else? Because you'll stop and do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you praise. You are so good. I'm so thankful for you. And I, I just absolutely love you, Jesus. And I thank you that you, you want to use us. That you want to use our lives. And we just pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will absolutely manifest in our lives. And you'll stop us in our tracks and show us people on our jobs. And show us people at our schools. And show us people and, and friends that we have. God and neighbors that we have and family members that we have that need the power of your presence in their life and allow us God help us to change the way we are so that we can stop and be interrupted so that you can use us to do something great we give you praise we give you glory thank you for today in Jesus name